thank you for this great opportunity. I'm really pleased and honored to uh, have the, the chance to introduce uh, the sessions here today. Um, as you um, understood from the uh, nice presentation of Philippe, I will be telling you a lot on uh, the human gut microbiota, more so than the chicken. Um, and uh, in my first slide, I just will uh, have the opportunity to emphasize I will be talking of humans and I will be talking of symbiosis, interaction between the microbes and, and the host as a key um, aspect of the work. On the uh, bottom left, uh, what I show here is the contributions of the microbiota to um, a physiology of the human, and it deals with uh, trophic and metabolic contributions. For example, it will provide the ability to degrade plant-related material, plant fibers, um, which also is important for the animals. Uh, it will contribute vitamins, B and K vitamins especially. It will also contribute the barrier function or colonization prevention, uh, which is quite important also in animal breeding. Um, direct interaction with the microbes and also with the immune system. And crosstalk with all the organs, including uh, muscles, brain, heart of the body. And we become microbial at birth, and we are microbial for our whole life. So even though I don't talk so much of chicken, I will tell you about yourself, actually. Uh, and we, uh, we built or we develop our microbiota at the same time in early life as we develop our immune system, and that leads to this unique situation where um, the microbiota is recognized as part of self by the immune system, which is a key element of the maintenance of symbiosis and health and well-being. There could be disruption, when it comes with uh, ecological aspects, then it's associated with loss of function and essentially barrier function or colonization prevention. And when it's at the level of immunity, then it comes with risk of immune-related disorders like autoimmune or immune uh, inflammatory conditions. So we want to uh, build knowledge, we want to understand, we want to monitor, and we want to be able to fine-tune the system. So we are, I am, you are, 100 trillion bacteria, and this is just talking of bacteria. There's even more phages, for example. There's yeast, fungi, protists sometimes uh, that are present, and they are present in, in the body and on, on the body, on the skin. Also at every mucosal interface, in the mouth or even in the lungs, uh, in the urogenital tract, and it, in the gut, obviously, where we have the most dense and diverse community. And if we look at numbers, just to, to start with, facing 23,000 human genes, we have, on average, 600,000 microbial genes. So this contribution is massive in terms of potential functionality, and that's where the science of the microbiome comes into play, and we're really happy to be able to uh, evolve on that system. Now, I have new concepts to bring, so I will start giving you my views of uh, symbiosis between uh, humans and microbes. And one of the reasons why there is such a big development is that uh, in spite of the uh, improvement in uh, health conditions, progress in medicine, increase in longevity of the humans, what we have been able to observe over the second half of the previous century is as we were controlling better and better infectious conditions, and this is the um, uh, slopes going down on the uh, left-hand side for you, at the same time, the observation in terms of epidemiology was the rise in immune-related conditions, essentially the big chronic diseases that we see expanding on Earth today. And, uh, well, the World Health Organization tells us that one person in four will be concerned by one or the other of those chronic conditions. So we need to think of prevention, and there's really an urgent need because we do not control that today. Just a snapshot on autism. Uh, in the U.S., the incidence has been going up exponentially, uh, like the contribution to this meeting. Uh, but this is worrying, actually. One person in 50 that is born in the U.S. today will be concerned by autism. In Europe, it's more like one out of 150. Uh, so we do not control. We have to understand what is going on here. And in turn, it may actually impact human longevity. So what did we do wrong to get into this uh, situation? There's a few elements that we can think of when we think of um, why this is happening. So I listed some of them at the top here. We have changed a lot of things that concern the microbiota and the interaction between the host and the microbiota 
over the past 60 years, roughly. We have changed everything that surrounds birth in terms of mode of birth and environment. We have changed nutrition a lot, um, and of course, physical activity as well. And we have changed exposure to, um, I will say, chemicals in the environment. This is true also for animal breeding. Uh, and this will have an impact on the microbiota. Just a few snapshots. Birth mode, C-section today, cesarean section, is one birth out of ten, uh, nine births out of ten in some places on Earth. In Rome, and Tramuros, it's actually 80% of births. So it's a decision. We do not need to go this far. But when we take this decision, we break the transition or the transmission of microbes from the mother to the child. So we expand into a new, uh, new world, in a way, new biology. Um, do we want to continue that? Do we want to find ways to uh, circumvent that? Um, nutrition, we've brought down the um, contribution of fiber to our diet to around 15 grams per, per day in, uh, in Europe. This is low, this is uh, down below the recommendations, which are 25 to 30 grams per day. And this is neglecting that we are microbial, as I mentioned already. Uh, and it will also have an impact in the way we manage uh, intensive animal uh, production. So if we take the various uh, disease conditions that are concerned by an impact on the microbiota, they concern the central nervous system, they concern the gastroenterological area, metabolism, immunity, also what we do in the clinics will have an impact on that. And in those contexts, what we do see is indeed we can document an alteration of the microbiota. In some cases, we can document very fine signatures of alteration of the microbiota, but this is not the whole story. It's not just the microbiota. We also see on the host side alterations. Leaky gut syndrome or increase in gut permeability, sometimes hyperpermeability. We see an inflammatory state, very often low-grade inflammation, uh, and coming with this, we have oxidative stress that can be um, systemic concerning the whole body. Uh, and I will document how this can actually turn into a vicious circle for all these conditions where we do not have uh, prevention in many cases, and we for sure do not have cure in many of those chronic, what we call non-transmissible conditions. Um, so the picture we can give, if we consider those elements, microbiota, gut barrier, inflammation, oxidative stress, is that of many interactions when everything goes fine, when we have symbiosis. And then upon various stress conditions, we will induce alteration. So we have documented alteration of the gut microbiota. Just uh, in a few words, it's a redu reduction in richness of the microbes or the genes of the microbes. It's loss of symbionts, the dominant population that is usually present in health, Will, be, uh, will tend to disappear, and it's increase in pathobionts, very often gram-negative pro-inflammatory bacteria. But at the same time, we see alteration of intestinal permeability, we see inflammation, we see oxidative stress, and what I illustrate here is this can go into a sort of vicious circle, auto-aggravate or sustain uh, one another. Um, and um, in fact, we would like to, uh, to be in this situation where we have a continuum between health and disease. If we see things going on the right-hand side towards the red, then we just find the solution to bring it back to the, uh, the green or the blue, and everything goes fine. But if you have the possibility of establishing a vicious circle, then what Martin Schaeffer tells us in, uh, in Wageningen, working on um, uh, ecological theories, is that there's no continuum anymore. You can have a break, and you can have alternative stable state the disease condition becoming a stable state because of the um, vicious circle. So that leaves us with four targets, and we can use those four targets. We have not done that today in terms of diagnosis, prediction, prevention, and therapy. So just keep that in mind for the rest of my talk. We could be dealing with, in terms of diagnosis, prediction, prevention, therapy, the possibility to deal with all four of those elements. And in fact, it goes beyond. The illustration of the alternative stable state is given here. So you have a stable state in green, this is the uh, health condition, a stable state in red, this is the disease condition. And if you press on stress conditions to the right, then for a long time, you will keep in 
the situation where you can be resilient, it can go back to normal. But if you push too far, then you go beyond the robustness of the system and you end up with the alternative disease state. But then if you return to lower stressful conditions, you will not immediately go back to the normal state. You will stay in the stable disease state for a long time, actually. So you need to go back to very, very low stress condition if you want to eventually return to the normal condition. So just keep that in mind. This illustration tells you that we, uh, we have to think of it. So one way to think of it is uh, we have tools that are available. For the moment, in human nutrition, what we play with is essentially the microbiota. So we, uh, we use uh, soluble, insoluble fibers, we use prebiotics, sometimes phage or quorum sensing modulators to modulate the microbiota. At the clinics, the, med the clinician deals with symptoms and organs, and so for the gut, for example, they will deal with inflammation. So they will use anti-inflammatory drugs. If they don't work, then they use corticoids, and if they don't work, then they have to remove parts of the body, essentially. And so what I'm showing here is we have tools to deal with all four elements of the vicious circle. If we want, we can use fibers, use commensal strains or probiotics or amino acids to deal with the barrier. We can use commensal probiotics or small molecules to deal with inflammation, and we even have tools to deal with oxidative stress. To my knowledge, this has not been done yet. So um, my talk is dealing with meta tools, uh, meta technologies. So essentially, we deal with the whole ecosystem as a start. And um, I will not talk so much of 16S ribosomal DNA work. I did a lot myself, but I will immediately bring you to uh, what we call metagenomics. So it's true whole genome shotgun sequencing based uh, characterization of the system. Uh, so, essentially, it calls for what is shown here, DNA extraction, uh, and it's a possible bias here. Um, even sample collection leads to possible bias. Whole genome sequencing, and then we assemble, we annotate genes, we want to be able to build a reference catalog. And uh, essentially, in a few uh, clicks, what we have done is indeed build the reference catalog, and I will give you illustrations of that. We have been able to design bioinformatics, to cluster genes into genomes for bacteria that have never been cultured in culture collection. Um, we have looked at ecological distributions of microbes, and we, we described what we call enterotypes. It's ecological settings in the human population. Um, and we identified low gene count or low richness, low diversity as a key health stratifier. Uh, and then we looked at the microbiome in many clinical conditions, essentially chronic uh, clinical conditions like type 2 diabetes, obesity, or inflammatory conditions, liver disease, and now we are working on uh, brain-related neurodegenerative or neuropsychological uh, alterations. So just a few, uh, a few highlights. The reference catalog, we started in 2010 with a 3.3 million reference catalog, and we expanded that after that 2014, we published this um, catalog based on uh, 1,267 human microbiomes. It's uh, 10 million gut genes. It's our reference today, essentially. And what is shown in color, if you look at the red curve, these are the genes that are most conserved between humans. And well, it shows that uh, after 100 individuals, we had already captured those few genes that are highly conserved within the human population. And that corresponds to a few species that we share, or we tend to share most. Uh, what is still increasing is rare genes. We will find genes that are specific of each and every person, essentially. So we have our own microbiome. Uh, now, for the, uh, for the animals, for the human, we have these 10 million genes. It's, um, well, now, today, it's close to 2,000 metagenomic species or genomes that we have been able to reconstruct. Uh, we've worked on pigs and chicken. The same tool, basically. We want to design the reference catalog because this is an essential asset for future work. Um, for the pigs, we have 7.7 .7 .7 million genes out of uh, close to 300 animals, and they represent uh, 700 metagenomic species. For the chicken, 300 animals, and this is actually 30 different groups of 10 animals of very different breeds and raising conditions. Um, 
high diversity, massive diversity, 9.7 million genes, 23,000 metagenomic species already identified, and this is progressing still today. So the pipeline we, uh, we use on my unit, Metagenopolis, is illustrated here. We start with a recommendation for sample collection. Already at this point, it's really critical, actually, I can tell you. DNA extraction, also very critical. And then we shotgun sequence, and we generate short fragments. So we do not construct genes and genomes anymore. What we do is with the small fragments that we generate by millions, we map on the reference catalog. So very quickly, we have an idea of the distribution of the genes within any sample that we collect. And of course, interfacing those um, gene abundance and species abundance with clinical conditions, then we can assess or identify relevant microbial players at the species level or build uh, prediction models. Standardization has been a, a big part of our work for a period of five years, actually, and the uh, standard operating procedures we made available in 2015 on the website that is indicated here, and they were actually published in 2017. Um, so this is just an illustration of the reconstruction of microbial genomes from metagenomic data. So we do not culture, we just use the metagenomic data and we look for very finely co-abundant genes. If they are finely co-abundant, whichever the sample they are present in, then they very likely belong to the same genome. And so using that, we have been able to describe uh, several hundred large metagenomic units that do correspond to bacterial genomes. Some we know, and many others, 85%, we did not know before. Um, and also very small metagenomic units that correspond to phages, to uh, plasmids, or CRISPR uh, elements. And that very often, actually, as illustrated on the right-hand side, will cluster with genes of the genome, as we would expect. Um, looking at the species, uh, we here highlight those that are mostly conserved. So we have 57 species that we will find in 90% of the human population we have been studying so far. And if we really get close to 100% conservation, then we only have 18 species that pop up. Some gram-positive dominant of the Firmicutes phylum, some gram-negative dominant, especially of the Bactroides and Prevotella uh, groups. It's small proportion. It's 20 or less than 20 out of uh, very often 200 dominant species per individual. So there's an illustration of very high inter-individual variation. Inter-individual variation we did find, actually, when we looked at ecological distribution. We were looking at the genus level, seeing, well, how does this person and that person compare, and we identified three um, groups of population in the general human uh, population we were looking at uh, that are dominated by one specific genus, but that also contain a whole uh, ecology. Uh, Bacteroides, Ruminococcus, Prevotella are the dominant genera. This was really unexpected. Uh, we still don't know exactly, finally, what it means in terms of uh, disease or risk of disease. We start to have some hints. Uh, what we connected that immediately with is food. Uh, so Gary Wu in the U.S. was working on uh, humans and uh, looking at the distribution in uh, enterotypes and showing that uh, if you are uh, the fast food type of uh, eater, then you will tend to be on the bacteroides side. If you are having uh, dietary habits rich in uh, plant material, in uh, fruits and vegetables, then you will tend to be on the right-hand side of the picture. <coughs> and it's also connected with gene count. Uh, so we did explore gene count uh, in a greater detail. And what the blue curve is showing here is the distribution in number of individuals as a function of gene count at the bottom. So we find from less than 200,000 genes in the dominant microbiome to more than 800,000. Some people, one million, actually. Uh, and what you see is the distribution is not the usual Gaussian even distribution. There's a king to the left, so we have individuals with low richness microbiota, individuals with high richness microbiota. And we worked a bit more on that, connecting that with, uh, with disease, as I will illustrate. So to summarize that, 
each dominant microbiota gathers on average 600,000 genes, but you see there's variation. Um, we are different by genes, by enterotypes or ecology, uh, by species uh, richness. Uh, the microbiota can be characterized by quantitative metagenomic profiling, and the, that gives you access to genes, hence to uh, pathways. Um, and a small proportion of the diversity is well conserved, constitute a, a shared metagenomic core. And yet we differ, as I mentioned. So where can we go from there in terms of, uh, of innovation? And that will link to uh, your concern in terms of animal breeding. So what I'm saying here is true for all contexts, basically. The microbiome is allowing us to develop tools for stratification, for monitoring over time. It's uh, giving tools for um, targeted modulation of the microbiota. Uh, there's potential for identification of novel bioactives, novel targets for therapies, and microbes can also be used as drugs uh, of their own. And so I will illustrate uh, some of that. A microbiome profile, we can go all the way to try to identify predictors. So um, I already shown this, uh, this slide. What we have been able to show is that individuals that have a low richness microbiome, um, they are in the green curve, non-obese individual, roughly 10% in the uh, healthy human population. Um, in the um, overweight, moderately obese population, 25%. In extreme obesity, actually, it's 75% of the population on the left-hand side. Those individuals are um, um, those that have less healthy metabolic and inflammatory um, traits. Especially in uh, overweight or obesity, we find in those higher cholesterol level, higher triglyceride, higher inflammation biomarkers, we find also in this group uh, the highest uh, insulin resistance. So diabetes, tendency for diabetes, and hence aggravation towards comorbidities. But this is also the individuals that will not respond to a certain treatment. Calorie restriction in the context of obesity, uh, immunotherapy in the context of cancer. And in the context of liver disease, there are also uh, or richness is also a marker of aggravation or severity. So just illustrations of that. In uh, our cohort of uh, 50 individuals in which we had an intervention, it was low-fat, high-protein, high-diverse fiber diet. Um, we could very easily separate high gene count and low gene count. And what we could show is that uh, if you belong to the high gene count, then we can improve your situation based on the diet. Essentially, we reduce uh, here uh, high sensitivity CRP, hence inflammation. Uh, but if you are on the low gene count side, then we have a hard time to do anything in terms of weight gain or weight reduction, uh, but also uh, inflammation and uh, lipid uh, parameters, triglycerides, for example. Uh, in the context of cancer, what we were able to, uh, to uh, uh, observe is that uh, if you are on the low richness side, then essentially you will be among those that have um, a shorter progression-free survival upon treatment with uh, immunotherapeutics. Here it's uh, anti-PD-1 anti-cancer drugs. On the left-hand side, this is true for non-small cell lung cancer. On the right-hand side, US colleagues, the group of Jennifer Wargo, work on uh, melanoma patients. Same observation. This is alpha diversity based on uh, 16S ribosomal DNA profiling. And, um, well, those that are non-responders to the treatment have lower diversity. Um, going into greater details, uh, the group of Wargo showed that um, there's uh, highlights of uh, the bacterial composition. Fecalibacterium, the genus Fecalibacterium, is associated when present with a longer progression-free survival, whereas the genus or the uh, order Bacteroidales is associated with shorter progression-free survival. So even at the fine level or finer level, uh, gut microbiota composition will impact. And while well, the observation of Fecalibacterium was striking for us because we've been working on this genus for, for quite a while now, 
we uh, described Fecalibacterium as a marker of health in uh, inflammatory bowel conditions, in colorectal cancer, in uh, irritable bowel syndrome, it was also observed. Uh, we were able to show that it expresses anti-inflammatory activity and it's a predictor of the length of remission or the remission time after um, biologics uh, treatment in Crohn's disease patients. And you can even see here uh, the time without uh, re um, relapse of the disease uh, when you have Fecalibacterium prausnitzi present above the median uh, population, then you have a curve that resembles that of, uh, of the cancer patients. So it's uh, among the strongest predictors of response to uh, immunolo immunotherapeutics in cancer together with prior immunotherapy. And there's a connection with antibiotic treatment. If you treat with antibiotic patients that will undergo immunotherapeutics in the month before or in the month after, then actually they lose chances of responding to the treatment. So this is immediately applicable in the clinics. What the red curve shows is the survival curve of patients with, a, in this case, non-small cell lung cancer or renal cancer or urothelial carcinoma. Uh, when they have been exposed to antibiotics in the period around the, uh, the treatment. So very uh, major importance. Now looking at animals, we've looked at the metagenome of pigs uh, and uh, focused on antibiotic treatment. This is the uh, overall uh, distribution on a PCA plot of pigs from China in red, from Denmark in green, and France in blue. And what you see is the Chinese pigs will separate from the French and Danish pigs, uh, and the drivers in terms of antibiotics will be many on the Chinese side, where it's uh, easily uh, available, so it's used a lot, actually. Uh, less on the uh, European side, with uh, vancomycin and tecoplanin as uh, the main drivers, so they will be used in extreme veterinary conditions. Um, and so, essentially, what you see is an impact of the, the ban for uh, growth promoters in, in Europe that is uh, visible, yet not 100%, uh, probably. And when you look at the um, composition of the microbiota in terms of a, a prevalence of antibiotic resistant genes, then you still see that there's a higher proportion for, uh, for the Chinese pigs. These are the antibiotic families that we were able to detect by a molecular assessment. Uh, the green and the, and the red are, and the blue are always uh, below, although for some of them it's not so, uh, so marked. So antibiotic usage for prophylaxis and treatment um, are still authorized worldwide in livestock, but uh, uh, there's regulation of growth promoter use in, uh, in Europe that has some, some visible impact. It will take a bit of time, probably. And then I want to illustrate work we are doing together with the, the University of Ghent, with Philippe and, uh, and Richard, and uh, also uh, Adiseo. Uh, we have this model of animals that was designed at Ghent, where animals have this diet switch, uh, antibiotic cocktail, bacterial cocktail, uh, Amearia exposure, and we sample the animals at day 26. Essentially, it's um, uh, mimicking the extreme uh, severe stress conditions that you could uh, have in, a, in real life. And uh, what we have done is we explore the composition of the metagenome of those animals um, and look for uh, species of bacteria, metagenomic species at the level of metagenome, that will be segregating controls and challenge animals, and we identify a lot. Philippe already uh, identified at the level of 16S ribosomal DNA markers. We identify the same and more in this context where we, uh, we scan all the, all the genes available. So um, there's 150 uh, that are uh, enriched in controls and 25 that are enriched in uh, challenge animals. So I only show some of them here in terms of distribution. For each species, what you see here is um, 40 genes, and it's color-coded, so white or blue is low abundance, and towards the red is, is high abundance. So some you will see are really highly discriminant. <clears throat> and so we also look at uh, impact or connection with the uh, parameters of health, and what we see is that uh, well, the blue part of the tree on the left-hand side at the top is the control animals, the green is the challenge animal. They really nicely separate 
in this uh, analysis. And we look at what we call uh, GMM, so it's uh, gut microbiota metabol metabolome or m metabolic uh, pathways. Uh, and we see that there is also a connection. So what you see is villus, crypt, villus to crypt ratio, villus length or body weight are nicely positively correlated with the uh, control condition, negatively correlated with the challenge condition, and it's the reverse for uh, ovotransferrin, colonic or ileol for CD3 area, for crypt death, coccidiosis uh, score or dysbiosis score. And this is connected with uh, many parameters of uh, microbiota metabolism to which we access by metagenomics. Among those, butyrate production is on the health side, so to speak, uh, polysaccharide degradation, or the ability to manage uh, oxidative stress radicals, uh, on, again on the left-hand side, peroxidase, propionate, or lactate metabolism on, on the right-hand side, on the stress or challenged uh, animal side. And so just to summarize what we have seen, is there's uh, over-representation in control animals of uh, several groups of bacteria, among which uh, I highlighted here Fecalibacterium, Butyricococcus, that were already uh, described by, uh, by Philippe, Roseboria, Lacnoclostridium as well. Uh, there's uh, several genera uh, among those that are known to produce butyrate, thereby to uh, act as potentially anti-inflammatory uh, microbes. Uh, and many other functional modules, including, for example, metagenesis, metanogenesis and uh, acetate metabolism. <clears throat> On the challenge side, Blautia, Acromantia, Lactobacillus, some Lacnospiracy uh, also uh, are overrepresented. And, uh, well, the functional modules essentially center around lactate, propionate, and uh, peroxidase, so oxidative stress generation. Um, now, a microbiome can be used as a target or even a, as a drug, so I will illustrate some of that. One slide on targeting. I already showed that uh, illustration where we, uh, we have this intervention with high protein, low fat, high diverse fiber diet. And what we were able to show, even though in the low gene count individuals, we have our time to modulate their health status, still, we can increase by 25% the richness of their microbiome. And as we see it today, it's very likely essentially due to primary substrates and their diversity. So if you increase the diversity of plant fibers in the diet, then you will promote diversification throughout the microbial food chain. You will feed the degraders that will feed the rest of the microbiota, essentially. Um, now you can go a bit further with metagenomics. This is a a more complex story, but we are using a very classical tool, essentially human, uh, report, human cells with a reporter system uh, that are commonly used to uh, test the ability of pathogens to induce response. For example, inflammatory response. So it's either cultured strains or DNA libraries. What we do is we overlay that with our ability to extract long fragments of DNA 40 kilobase fragments, so it's 40 to 50 genes of any gut microbes. There is no culture here. Uh, and then we clone that into E. coli. And that's the E. coli clones, so essentially a fragment of genome of a gut bacterium uh, and its products that we expose onto human cells. And we do identify modulation of various activities. We started publishing on that in 2007. We have at hand today actually close to 500,000 metagenomic clones that we can use for testing any condition. So far we work on a essentially human uh, cell models that tell us about modulation of immunity, modulation of proliferation of metabolism or uh, endocrine functionalities, i.e. production of, of neuroactive peptides, for example, PYY, GLP-1, that act on the brain on um, modulation of or perception of satiety. So we work on enteroendocrine cells in this context, but a lot also on epithelial cell models. Uh, I will just illustrate one segment we did on nf kappa -B. We screen thousands of clones. We find some that are active uh, inducers of nf kappa -B response or some that are down regulators of nf kappa -B response. With one of those clones that pops up as a, an activator of immune defenses outside of a general massive contribution of clones that do not very much compared to the control in black. Uh, we occasionally find uh, anti-inflammatory or 
inhibitors of the NF-kappa B pathway? Well, we took one of the top ones, and we looked at its ability to uh, modulate uh, the um, integrity of human intestinal tissue. So we use big segments of tissue uh, using the, uh, the tool that Maria Resigno has developed in Milan. Um, and well, we overlay on top of that either the clone or the E. coli that we use for construction of the clone library or just control medium. What you see is um, if everything remains fine, then you have control medium, control E. coli, and our NF-kappa B modulating clone, the tissue is intact everywhere. If we expose the tissue to a, a toxinogenic salmonella strain, then actually you uh, destroy the tissue. But you destroy the tissue with the control medium, you destroy with the uh, control E. coli, but it remains intact with our metagenomic clones. So not only does it modulate NF-kappa B pathway, but it also will have an impact via interleukin uh, production, for example, on the preservation of the integrity of the gut tissue. So it goes all the way to potentially uh, bioactivity in vivo in the, in, the, in the intestine. I'm going back a little bit to fecalibacterium just to uh, tell you where we are today. It's been uh, 15 years uh, work, actually. Uh, the first key publication was that of Arisocol in 2008, where we could show that if you have fecalibacterium present in the gut, then it's protective. For even patients that we, uh, we operate, they remove the ileocecal region of the gut, then you put back in continuity, and if you have fecalibacterium present, they are protected. If you do not have fecalibacterium present, six months later, all of them will have a relapse of the disease. And so it seemed to be key, then we could document its ability to act uh, as an anti-inflammatory uh, bug. This is IL-8 production by HT29 cells that are stimulated by TNF-alpha, and you see that even the last ones uh, shown in, uh, in the under, under, underline in blue, that are new strains, they are also uh, uh, active anti-inflammatory uh, potential. <clears throat> and we could identify candidate in anti-inflammatory metabolites, one protein so far, and several small molecules that can contribute to the bioactivity. This is work of my colleague Philippe Langella today. Um, now, following this story, there's been a, a new company, this is the second line here, uh, that was created very recently, it's called Next Biotics, and essentially what it's doing is it's mass culturing fecalibator and prosnitsi, and then lyophilizing, put it in uh, capsules, and going for a clinical trial where you administer the strain to humans and try to see whether you get the bioactivity in humans. Uh, it will have to be a phase one in healthy individuals before you go to phase two in, in patients. This is also true for many microbes. Fecalibacterium prosnitsi is only one, but Bacteria fragilis with the work of uh, Sarkis Masmanian, Eubacterium halli with the work of Max Nudor, Pachermansia mucinifila with the work of Patrice Cani, some of them for which we have an idea of at least one of the key bioactive molecules. Um, and many of those come with a, a small company that is again doing the same. So there's many developments, and there could be the same for animals actually, that uh, go for the production of the, uh, the strains towards application as a live biotherapeutics. Uh, this is using single strains. Uh, what is really emerging today very rapidly is the application of ecosystem, whole ecosystem as a drug. So this is the uh, end of my presentation. Essentially what is shown here is the result of the Van Nude publication dealing with um, uh, fecal microbiota transfer in the context of recurrent Clostridium difficile infection. So essentially, it's the result of uh, an ecological uh, stress. Uh, very often, antibiotics in the clinics that alter the microbiota lead to loss of barrier function, colonization by Clostridium difficile, and if you cannot remove it with the first antibiotic treatment, then in most cases, it will remain chronically, and it was shown that uh, if you use or if you compare the last resource antibiotic vancomycin on the right in red to fecal mycobiota transfer, then what you see is with vancomycin you will eradicate the pathogen in 30% of the patients. Uh, if you combine with uh, gut uh, cleansing, it doesn't help. Uh, whereas in mycobiota transfer, you cure more than 80% of the patients with a single try. 
If it doesn't work, then you can try again, and you will cure more than 90% of the patients. In fact, when the trial was run, there was an intermediary analysis, and it was considered non-ethical to continue, because the new treatment was so way more effective than the usual one. Uh, so every patient was transferred to a fecal mycobata uh, transplantation. And today, it's uh, acknowledged as a treatment by the regulatory agencies, the FDA in the US, uh, INSM in France, uh, same in Italy, it's applied every day. So there's been thousands of patients that have been cured of their Clostridium difficile by this treatment. Um, now, I work with a, a small company as scientific advisor. The name is Matt Pharma. It's based in France, in, uh, in Lyon. And uh, Matt is developing um, the preparation of human intestinal content as a tool for treatment, especially in cancer patients. And what I'm illustrating here is a phase 1B2A trial. So it's really the pilot trial you start with in acute myeloid leukemia patients. It's patients that have not been treated so much before. They arrive in the hospital, and upon diagnosis, when you determine that they have AML, uh, what we could do in this case is collect a stool sample before they go into induction chemotherapy. This is the first treatment, very harsh, uh, that aims to remove white blood cells that are cancerous. And then they go for antibiotics. They have really highly reduced uh, immunity for another 15 days. After 21, 29 days, what we did is we re-administer their own microbiota to the patient. So it's autologous to demonstrate, or to try to demonstrate, that we would be able to uh, rebuild completely the microbiota. Uh, and then the patients are back in the hospital 10 days later for consolidation chemotherapy, and then they are followed over time for 12 months. And what we were able to show at the bottom here as a summary, we get 90% recovery of the microbiota. Probably this is related to the fact that we are autologous, so you already have the adaptation between the immune system and the uh, microbiota of the patient. Um, and so on the first uh, left-hand side uh, uh, figure, you have the breaker test dissimilarity how much you alter the microbiota. From V1 to V2, after chemotherapy and antibiotic treatment, you alter dramatically the microbiota. And after re-administration, autologous transfer, then you reconstruct. And that's where you reconstruct 90% at the level of diversity index, at the level of species uh, similarity or genus similarity. In the center, we focus or we zoom on butyrate-producing bacteria that are uh, rapidly called beneficial bacteria here. Um, it can be seen as a biomarker of competitive exclusion in a way. They are completely altered at V2, but they are fully reconstructed at V3. And many of those are extremely oxygen sensitive. So the process that Mad Pharma is using allows to preserve those bacteria very well so that they can actually be re-established. And if you look at the inflammation biomarker, in this case neopterin on the right hand side, well, you have an inflammatory burst after the, uh, the treatments, and again, you restore complete immune homeostasis after the autologous transplantation. Looking at uh, overall uh, gut health, the patients recover normal transit um, within, um, within a few days, within one day, essentially, after administration, and they survive better, actually. We had 94% survival after one year when the uh, usual historical control data is 70%. Now this is a small uh, cohort of individuals, 25 patients, so you cannot expand so much on that, but this was very encouraging. So to summarize, we humans share a core microbiome, yet we differ uh, in details at the level of genes, of species, ecology, or gene count, and microbiome gene count is really a a key stratifier of health. This biosis should be viewed as not just a microbiota story, but really an alteration of the whole context of symbiosis. Um, and I mentioned the vicious circle and the possibility of long-term alteration. Microbiota modulation should be considered as a target, especially if you want to work on a personalized or individualized nutrition for humans uh, towards reinforcement or adjuvant strategy in combination with current therapy in patients. And nutrition, and within nutrition, fibers, prebiotics, 
uh, or live microbes, single strains or cocktails, or even whole ecosystems, may be strategic bioactives for the maintenance, for the preservation, or the restoration of man microbe symbiosis. Uh, and my summary, uh, quoting uh, uh, Pierre-André Gérard, actually, from Adiceo, um, a major way of leveraging prevention will probably be a nutritional uh, ecology. I uh, thank you very much for your attention. On this slide, you have the list of my colleagues who contributed and our founders.